you are and where, and where you are at. Oh, that's right. Yes, we record these meetings so that we can share with the students later on. <laughs> Sounds um, good. If we could start with um, uh, how you, where you are and your background and perhaps how you got into uh, this, the field that you are in right now. Sounds good. I do have some slides I can share. Yes. That would be helpful. And I have some extra slides in the back we can go through if we have time or we don't have to, but I had them. So I figured it was worth throwing them in. Let's see here. Great. Is that? Yes, I can see. see. For some reason now I'm seeing, I'm not seeing the full. Oh, I know why it's because I have a second monitor. That's what it's being weird. Let's see, there is better. I just turned it off. Okay, is that still working fine? Yes. Okay, and let me see if I put this on. Where's that? There we go, slideshow. Let's see if that works. Does that work? Mm -hmm. It is. Are, are your faces in the way of the slide at all, or is that just on my side? Oh, there. Uh, okay. It is not on the way in our, on our side. Okay. All right. So my name is Laura Aguilar. Um, I These are just some fun pictures, since pictures make things more interesting. Um, I grew up in California on a farm, and I originally wanted to be a veterinarian. I love science. I loved anything to do with animals, helping sick animals, playing with animals, whatever I could find um, in that regard. So I went to college at University of California at Davis, which is a, a school that's well known for veterinary, for its veterinary school. Um, and then during my undergraduate four years there, I, um, in preparation for hopefully going to vet school, I ended up working in a lab um, to do some research. And that was something that was told I needed to do to get into to school. I'm not really thinking I would become a scientist. And surprisingly, I really liked it. I liked working in the lab. I was working with mice, but I wasn't so much interested in, you know, the, the mice in terms of trying to heal them, but we were using them for research purposes. And I started really appreciating more and more the needs of um, developing better medicines for diseases that could be used for, for animals, but especially for people, which is, um, and I think maybe also during that time, my grandfather was very close to had a heart attack. And so I kind of started to become a little bit more aware that, oh, people can get sick. People you love can get sick. And, um, and so through, through that experience, I started thinking maybe actually medical school would be um, more interesting. And so I did um, a summer internship in a hospital to see if I would like that. I thought, I always thought I wanted to be outdoors all the time and wouldn't like being in a hospital. But the world of seeing people who were sick being healed by, by doctors and nurses and all of the staff that helped them in that setting was really invigorating and thrilling to me. Um, so I ended up changing and applying to medical school instead. When I did that, one of the schools I applied to was actually in Texas. And that school had a special program called the MD PhD program, where you could get a combined medical school, medical degree and a PhD in a, in a science area. And it was funded by the government. And um, so it was eight eight to 10 year long program. And I just, I would lo had loved working in the lab. And so I just said, okay, well, I'll take it. That sounds great. So um, that's what I ended up doing. So I had to move to Houston, um, which changes your whole life kind of when you do something like that, where you're moving somewhere where you have to be for at least eight years. And I ended up being there for 13 years. So, <laughs> um, And um, there I did my PhD in immunology working in a lab where we did a lot of um, genetic um, kind of molecular biology, I guess uh, I would say, PCR, maybe something that you all are learning about and that type of thing. Um, but I was on the uh, focused on the path of learning about how the immune system works. 
So the system that helps you fight infection, but also helps your body fight cancer. And um, so I did that. And then I also did the medical school part. After I finished both medical school and the PhD, I um, did my residency. So after medical school, then usually you need to do a residency to specialize in some field. And I specialized in pediatrics to take care of kids. And then I um, further did a fellowship after that to specialize in pediatric cancer. And after that, I um, we um, we moved to so in the during that process. So this man here in the middle with me and with the standing there with the lab notebook is my husband. We had met way back in the lab in in um, in California. And uh, he uh, was getting his PhD in um, genetics at that time. And as you can see over there on the right, I just had a little bit about him because his story is really interesting. Um, he grew up in Guatemala and he moved to California when he was 12 and learned, had to learn English from like watching TV and, you know, sitcoms and things like that. Went through the public schools in uh, California as a non-English speaking uh, person. So very challenging, but he managed to thrive and he's very intelligent, so that might help. <laughs> and he um, really loved math and science, ended up um, after graduated from high school, went to college there in California in Bakersfield um, where he was living at the time. And then he went back to Guatemala to go to medical school. Um, and after his um, father got sick with prostate cancer, he uh, came back to the US to help him his family, help his family, and then ended up deciding to go do a PhD um, in genetics at uh, UC Davis, where we met. And he has um, always been working on kind of studying the basis of cancer, how, um, how it happens, and then how to develop treatments for it um, from that are using genetic tools like genetic engineering, gene therapy, and then immunotherapy as well. So he ended up coming to Baylor College of Medicine uh, with me in Houston, and then um, he had a laboratory there and um, and uh, did our research there. And then we ended up, uh, we moved to Boston for uh, positions at Harvard. And um, a few years after we were here, um, some of the work that it, we were doing, um, particularly that he was doing in his lab at, in Houston, was starting to look really promising um, for cancer, including prostate cancer. And, um, but it really needed a company to take, it kind of had gone as far as it could in the, in the um, academic setting and needed a company, a biotech company to really take it to the next step. And so um, we ended up starting that company. So he, um, he left and I stayed on for a few more years. Somebody had to make make a living and support the family. And uh, so we started the company basically in our basement and eventually grew it um, to uh, to a company that um, we went public in 2021. So up there in the top right corner is the, is the picture from NASDAQ of the company when we went public. And the company now is continuing to develop products um, for prostate cancer, brain cancer, pancreatic cancer, and lung cancer. Um, we both left the company a couple of years ago and are doing different things, including some projects in um, in uh, Mexico where we're trying to help develop help develop the skills there for people to develop their own medicines in uh, Mexico. Um, and that could be translated to other countries in, in the area as well. Uh, I'm also um, chair of Young Women in Bio for Boston. So we've been doing some work with BioBuilder and others to try to help bring STEM opportunities to students um, in the greater Boston area. And I'm also serving on the board of um, a brain tumor association, working as a consultant and uh, for different companies. Um, we have two kids that are super interesting, <laughs> which might have to be a topic for another time. If you ever are interested, I can recruit them. One of them, um, the oldest one is 28 and she's a PhD student at Harvard and 
is studying uh, lions in Kenya. So she goes to Kenya, puts collars on lions and do, um, and um, collects scat from the lions and does PCR analysis on the scat or sequencing and uh, to identify which lion was where and also what the lion has been eating and also puts tags on um, livestock. She works with the local people and farmers and puts uh, ear tags on livestock so that she can also track when the lions are interacting with the livestock to try to help understand how the conflict happens and then hope with the hope that we, they can develop better ways to um, preserve both the lions and the livestock. Mm. The other one uh, was actually um, all through school was more like a English and history kid, not so the first one, she, she thought she wanted to study lions since she was three when she saw the Lion King <laughs> and never gave up. Um, the other one uh, was really not focused, didn't want to have anything to do with whatever her parents were doing and uh, <clears throat> went to college thinking she was going to be a, involved in international relations or politics or something like that. And then took a community health class um, and decided that actually... Yeah. She was more interested in working and helping, yeah. excuse me, be on the front lines of helping patients, not just talking about policy. So she just started medical school at Harvard and uh, after doing a Fulbright uh, fellowship in Guatemala. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I feel bad for making you talk a lot, but I think... Um, some of the things that you mentioned about your daughter going and collecting the scat from the lions to extract the DNA, the students, um, right, they're coming off of spring break here, but they, right before spring break, they extracted DNA from uh, the bacteria and they are going to be running PCR this Saturday. So this is a very perfect, um, perfect time and it kind of um, melds with your your PhD when you were doing your immunology mm -hmm. study and molecular biology and PCR. Um, they're going to be learning about the concept today after right. our time here and then they'll be running it in the in the lab and um, pouring their own gels and running it. Um, oh, so, great. Well, so you see it, it can be used for many different things. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. It's a versatile technique that's really in almost every every part of molecular biology now and different research. Mm -hmm. research. Yeah. Well, okay. when I started in the lab doing my PhD, um, PCR was just being invented. Mm -hmm. Sounds like I must be really old, which I am pretty old, but it, it just to give you the idea that it wasn't um, always available and it was, you know, it was, groundbreaking it, you know it, it was a total game changer yes for my phd in particular <clears throat> yeah definitely was um i also remember um in in undergraduate my um mentor uh where i did my thesis he was um telling me how when he was in grad school he had three of the students who know pcr um this uh, will be familiar. If not, we'll talk about it in about half an hour. But there's a there are three temperature cycles to make the reaction work. And um, my mentor had three water bath with a timer and would physically take the tubes out and transfer them that's, and do that thirty cycles. Whatever. That's how I, that's how I did it. So funny yeah. story. That's how I we were having to do it. So yeah, <laughs> we would be in the lab all night long because you had to. <laughs> tubes I mean right, You're right. so a funny story because of that and my husband was still in California in the lab there and so we were talking and he actually worked at the company where the guy who invented PCR was working originally so they were working on trying to develop at that company um, uh, working on developing an enzyme for that would be able to because the problem was you even had to add new enzyme every cycle because the right. enzyme is killed by the high temperature. So they were developing an enzyme that was not sensitive by 
I think they were using bacteria that they were uh, that was adapted to be able to survive at different temperatures. Mm-hmm. And that's when they did it. Um, anyway, so so he was very involved in all of that. And so he had the idea that we should to try to develop a machine to be able to have the temperature change without you having to do that. And so he ended up he ended up making a machine out of like uh, parts from a washing machine or something like that in a water bath. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so he ended up it, developing this and it was working so well that he shipped the, all the parts over to Houston for, and then we, he came over and set it up there. And so everybody was coming around looking at this machine that now you didn't have to do it by hand. And then it was only, I don't know, six months or a year later that there were companies that developed machines mm-hmm. that were much better at it, but we at least got, we got, we were ahead of the game. Yes. <laughs> It's great. Um, um, do people have questions? I mean, I have a few more slides that are like more general about like what is biotech and what is like how you know you use a virus to treat cancer a little. But there, we can also just talk if people would rather just ask questions. Are there questions from students? I think uh, perhaps. Oh, I see chats, but I can't see them, I guess, because I'm sharing my screen. Maybe it won't. Um, there is a question. Uh, Ruby is asking, what is your favorite part of your job? Ah, uh, well, right now, I would say my favorite part is talking to young people about science. <laughs> uh, so that would be my young women in bio chair job. Uh, but I also um, really like just creating things. So trying to like solve problems. Uh, and as I've been working with um, several different companies and different things, just being able to help them put the pieces together and think about how can we take this science and make it a medicine for patients. And it's a long process, uh, but it's really exciting to to see how that can you know become a reality. And- mm-hmm. And hearing stories about patients that have been helped by by uh, medicines that you know that that didn't exist you mm-hmm. know before is is really exciting. Yeah. Um, another question is uh, Hajar is asking, how long did it take for you to obtain your PhD and your MD degree? For me, I was lucky that I had a very supportive advisor that helped me get it done. And so the whole thing was eight years, four years of medical school and four years of PhD. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so those of you in the, um, in the group, so MD is always four years, but the PhD part can depend as it depends on your mentor. So it could be anywhere from four to, I think maybe six years, perhaps a little longer. I think I don't know if this is true. Uh, in general, when the when you are MD PhD student, the mentors try to help you get along and move along, um, so that you don't end up staying, let's say, for eight years for a PhD. True, and and it, part of what helps that by doing that combination program is that the um, some of the classes overlap. So like. My medical school classes helped counted towards some of my graduate school coursework. And um, and then I I think the medical school was even slightly short shortened by the fact that like some medical students have some blocks where they'll go and do research, but I'd already done research as a PhD, mm-hmm. so I didn't. So there are ways to to make it work well. Um and the other thing that I think is important to is funding is important. So like my um, daughter who's doing her PhD right now, studying lions, um, she, um, hers is a six year, you know, at least Mm -hmm. six years, but she's funded for six years. So, you know, it's a graduate student stipend, but it's not bad, it's it's livable. And I think the most important thing is to enjoy what you're doing along the way, not be just doing something to get to a goal and hating it along the way. if you like what you're doing, 
then the time isn't it isn't so so draining. Mm -hmm. It's very true. It's a long term and, commitment, right? And you and you have to still have a balanced life along the way. So, you know, I ended up. Um, our first daughter was born while I was a resident, um, and the second while I was doing my fellowship. So, mm -hmm. you know, you you just have to. You make it work and, you know, everybody has a life outside of work or outside of school as well. And um, programs, you know, everybody needs to be supportive of that. Yeah, that is very true. Um, are there any other questions? I think Dr. Aguilar's husband's story is also very inspiring. I imagine a lot of your, the students here may be interested in healthcare. Are there any other questions? Um, can put it in the chat or if you think of questions you can put it in the chat and i can also email um dr aguilar i have something here that says like 11 chat things in the chat but maybe um oh yes the students were putting in their school for uh attendance earlier oh okay uh, good good i just can't see them um yeah oh and um so a student would like to, Vanessa would like to see some of the other so slides oh, that sure. you have prepared if possible. Yeah, I'll just pop through them and then we can do it quickly. Let's see now. Thank you. There we go. So this was just something, um, we gave a presentation to a high school up in Lawrence and they wanted us to talk about what is biotech and things like that. So I thought it might be interesting to you all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just, you probably have already talked about this, but I thought it was kind of useful to break down the word, you know, when you hear new words. So biotech or bio is just short for biotechnology. And this just comes from the word bio, meaning living and studying living things. And technology is just using knowledge to make new things. So that's what we do in biotechnology where, you know, it can apply to anything from back, making vaccines, drugs, things to diagnose um, like tests, for viruses like COVID, um, but even for cosmetics, for food um, um, studies as veterinary, things like that. And there's a lot of different jobs in uh, biotech, everything from doing the research, working in the lab, but there's also things like sales and the manufacturing side and the medical side and um, training and managing people and information technology, all of that. So there's a lot of different pieces that go into it. And Boston is the number one um, area for biotech in the United States. So this is the hub, yeah, Boston, the greater area. Boston area, not just Boston, but the whole greater Boston area. So there's, it's a really great place to be if you're interested in this. This is just shows like the timeline of how our, um, <coughs> excuse me, prostate cancer <laughs> product that we worked on went all the way from being in the mice to going in the human. To, this is a picture of the office in our basement <laughs> to being on, uh, on Wall Street. Uh, this just shows you um, that, you know, even things like viruses that we think are bad causing things like COVID <laughs> can also be used for good. And one of the ways that that happens is they can be used kind of like a car or an airplane, you know, can transport things so they can be genetically engineered to carry a different gene of interest into, um, into uh, human cells to try to fix a genetic um, defect or to add something that would be useful like to treat cancer. And one of the areas which this has been done is in brain cancer an area that I'm very involved in. And um, in this, this is just a picture of um, <laughs> of a brain tumor that had been treated with a um, herpes virus uh, in, a, in a kid with a brain tumor. Um, and the idea there is for the, the virus can actually um, kind of kill some of the tumor cells and also uh, stimulate the immune response to come in and help uh, clear out the cancer. And this is just an example of how there are many different 
jobs, like I was saying before. Um, this is just another visual way of showing it, that there's many different ways that you can apply PCR or all mm -hmm. the different things that you're going to be learning or that you have been learning at BioBuilder to um, to the world of um, of health field, health related fields. And I think this is the last slide. You just need to um, to get these jobs. You just need to have ideas, be creative, get a good education, and have good direction. Oh, there is one more slide. I just remembered. This is you may have already heard from this from some of our other. Um, speakers mm -hmm. from YWIB, but I'll just put it out there in case anybody missed it. This is the um, ambassador program where uh, sophomore and junior high school students um, can uh, join us as an ambassador. Um, and the applications for next year are due by May 17th. Yes, that's great. And I think I, I agree, completely agree that what you are learning right now, it could be PCR, but it could also be working with other people, science, communicating, all of that can be applied to help launch all of your um, interest and turn it into a job or a career um, or more education. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is very true. Are there any last, last questions? Uh, the question from Pranav is, what kind of viruses do you use? And do you use any bacteriophage? Oh, good question. Um, we have worked on um, adenovirus is the main one that we've used and herpes virus. So adenoviruses cause, um, when, they, when they cause disease in people, they can cause cold symptoms uh, or... Uh, uh, sometimes things like diarrhea, um, but we use a adenovirus and we've taken out some of the genes that allow it to cause disease. And in place of those genes, we're able to put in a different gene uh, or different genes that we want to use um, for therapeutic purposes. In the case of the herpes virus, it um, can also cause things like cold sores and um, but it also is um, is genetically modified so that it can't cause those symptoms anymore. Um, but that can uh, can kill uh, tumor cells. Um, and I've also used in other projects, um, like when I was at Harvard, I worked on a project for muscular dystrophy using adeno associated virus, which is another one called AAV. Um, I have not worked on bacteriophages, but I think other people are. I've heard about other um, groups in academia and in companies trying to develop bacteriophages. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think this was very, very um, helpful and also uh, inspiring and fun. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. It always has to be fun. <laughs> and I appreciate your time. Um.